psychiatry. Um, I came to psychiatry uh, kind of uh, as, as a backup. I thought I was going to become a neurosurgeon and spent a lot of time during medical school rounding with the neurosurgeons until I started to realize that they're very interested in piping, you know, connecting vessels back together, um, uh, trying to deal with uh, bleeds and not that interested in actually how the, the gray matter worked. Um, as it turned out, the rotation that was most interesting to me was the psychiatric rotation at Northwestern. I actually went to med school there. Um, and that uh, led me to do a pharmacology fellowship. I, during my medical school, uh, went to uh, Mass General uh, Psychiatry um, and rapidly within the first week of, uh, of being in the residency at Mass General came under the, the, the um, uh, mentorship or you might even call guardianship of, of Steve Hyman. Um, some mentors are, you know, really guide you very closely. He guided me very closely, still does. I still report to him, um, which is kind of interesting at my old age. Um, the title here is a bit provocative. It's meant to be, okay? I come from kind of an extreme edge of the psychiatric world. I think clinicians are working really hard to deal with intractable problems right now. And it, and it behooves us in academia to give them better tools. They're working really hard, trying to put Band-Aids on massive wounds. It's, it's, it's really tough. And our society doesn't necessarily care for psychiatric illness. Just look at how we care for long-term addicts, how we, we talk about mental illness, you know, and make a lot of statements about pull yourself up by your bootstraps and crud like that. It's really unfortunate how psychiatry is treated. And I, I should say psychiatry and psychology. Although I was trained as a psychiatrist after five total postdoctoral fellowships, I do mathematical psychology predominantly in brain imaging, a lot of AI now. So I'm kind of on the edge of psychiatry. You might call me a computational psychiatrist, a mathematical psychologist. Um, I actually seem to resonate and spend more time with mathematical psychologists than I do with anybody else these days or people actually in the AI space. So, this title is provocative. Psychiatry, when I started, didn't have a model of the mind. We were still coming out of this post-psychodynamic world where it was fuzzy, felt good, but there was no mathematics by which you could actually make predictions, consistent predictions. And you know, I went into imaging thinking that would make a difference. Um, we still don't have a standard model of mind in psychiatry and clinical psychology. And I see this as a major major problem. I see psychiatry and psychology as headless. I actually am writing a paper right now that's how psychiatry, the current headless horseman, can stop terrorizing the countryside and find its head. And I actually mean that. I think psychiatry and psychology have a lot of work to do to gain the trust of society and to provide objective tools that are replicable and actually highly predictive. What I'm going to talk about today is an effort to move toward that how I started out in imaging, how imaging has done amazing things. But to some degree, it represents what you might call neuroescapism. How we seem to be moving into the space of saying, let's talk about the brain. Let's not talk about the mind. Let's not talk about really what is an emotion? What is attention? What is memory? What does it mean that memory is degrading? There are all types of ways to think about this in a very quantitative fashion but psychiatry is, is kind of still far away from adapting these. We'll then talk about kind of how one aspect of, of uh, mathematical psychology has made immense progress, namely the space of reward aversion processing. It just happens to be that reward aversion processing seems to be at the core of all psychiatric illness, not just, not just mood disorders, anxiety disorders, not just trying to predict suicidality and other types of disruptive behavior or destructive behavior, but also dealing with uh, movement disorders, dealing with psychosis. It seems to be a core function for everything that we do in terms of judgment and decision-making. I'll talk about kind of how the mathematics of a core construct came about and its implications, especially for artificial intelligence. Um, I now am funded by the Navy to build out the first automated mental health assessment system. I expected to be deploying it within two to three months in very small ways around, around depression, anxiety, and suicidality. 
and then building it out over the next five to six years to more extensively kind of engage with the full range of DSM-5 disorders. This is something you will see a lot of. So we'll be talking about AI, machine learning, um, and the fact that it's actually quite dumb right now. But down the road, as you start integrating computational cognitive science with classification engines, you get some much smarter uh, outcomes. So we'll talk about that. I have to make a few um, um, uh, necessary uh, statements here about a declaration of financial um, conflicts of interest. I have no financial interest or relationships to disclose with regards to the neuroscience or computational behavior in this talk. I do own three companies though. I have founded three companies that are in the application of this to commercial non-academic purposes. Toggle is around recommendation engines. Spark is actually an all women runs. Uh, the C-suite is all women um, for dating and um, uh, for um, uh, uh, recommendations of, of friends. It's, uh, it's, we're gonna have to change the name. It turns out that the, the person who started TikTok is using a similar name. So we're gonna be changing that name, but there's a whole bunch of really cool things that can be done with this. In terms of everything I'm going to talk about in this talk, for academic purposes, it's all open, easily accessible, and can be used by anybody. I got to thank a large number of people. I might be the face up here, but it's, it's literally hundreds of people up here who are talking about this. I run the Warren Wright Adolescent Center right now at Northwestern. Large number of people have been very critical for, for making the work uh, I'm going to talk about happen. I ran the Applied Neuromarketing Consortium at Northwestern for about seven years. They were fundamental too. Right now I'm uh, working with Aglos Katseglos. He's a very senior AI machine learning expert at Northwestern to run this Office of Navy Research Program. Um, the, uh, the Laboratory of Neuroimaging Genetics, I still have a small presence there with Ann Blood. Um, and then my cognitive psychology students whom I've been teaching for the past 10 years, invaluable input. I, I can't thank them enough. And then before I left to uh, Northwestern, large number of people were involved with the Phenotype Genotype Project. Here are just a few of them. I put into red some of the more senior investigators, but nothing good happens without large numbers of people. Um, and I'm a big advocate of, of group science. All right, the topics, I kind of started getting into this. We're gonna start with this core hypothesis that neuroscience provide what is necessary to me me mechanistically define systems breakdowns underlying um, mental illness. We need to move past this. We need to think about this as basically neuroescapism and confront the problem of what happens when we start talking about maps, going from behavior to neuroscience. What does a map really do? Um, how we need to focus on behavior. What are behavioral primitives? We need to follow the example of what has been done in physics to build out a standard model in equations of the mind. It can be done. Um, how these types of, of, of quantitative equations can be used for feature engineering, for machine learning, and then extending it to, to studies of mechanism. I'll end by kind of a little bit about some of the per permutation-based statistics merged with mediation moderation that we've developed to be able to go across scale and what this means. So I will try to avoid any equations. You'll see a bunch of graphs. I'm going to move fast. I tend to want to try to focus on the core concepts. I realize you, there, that may leave a lot of questions more than open to discuss any of these. But the main focus here is not the details. It's a bigger, bigger picture. All right. So in psychiatry and clinical psychology, and I hope you don't mind me kind of grouping them together, but I see them as kind of in a common boat trying to fight a common problem having to do with the, the distress of our, our clients and patients. Um, psychiatry came out of a, a mess in terms of the models that we were using. Very fuzzy, incredibly non-quantitative, and the qualitative aspects didn't really lend themselves to any type of predictive capabilities. We ended up by default having to kind of go back to some older models. And I call this the ethological reinforcement model coming out of Skinner. You can talk about this in the context of incentive uh, stimulus response, going from a stimulus to response. We're talking about a behavior going back to a consequence. They're the opposite sides of the same wheel. Um, Reinforcement reward has become the more kind of common framework, although people like Peter, uh, uh, Peter Dayan and Reed Montague are heavily focused on the, the stimulus response incentive piece. From this type of model, you talk about these SR or behavior consequence relationships, connecting modules or subroutines of behavior together like that circle. You connect these together with SR relationships or behavior consequence relationships to ultimately have a, a chain of behaviors. 
That's a kind of a, a, a common model. You go to the Society of Neuroscience, you'll see 30,000 neuroscientists scampering around talking about all types of cool stuff in molecular biology and cellular biology. Their model of mind is this and nothing more. Sometimes they go a little bit further to talk about cognitive science and reference the, the seminal work of Minsky, Chomsky, Shannon, and many others. Um, cognitive, traditional cognitive science has its own issues though. Um, uh, we talk about things in terms of modularity in cognitive science, how you can have information. That's what the H down there in the bottom left is about going in and through an attentional filter. Um, you might call it a Triesman filter to being assessed in terms of multiple uh, frameworks for what is rewarding and aversive, connecting to memory, being used for um, uh, uh, judgment and then decision making, helping with planning, um, having insight, ultimately having an output, whether it's through language, motor function, or autonomic function. You're probably aware of the somatic marker model of emotion from uh, Antonio Damasio and Antoine Bachera. That's kind of getting at the autonomic function. That's a form of output too. How information goes out into the environment, that's HE, and then becomes back to become information that becomes internal. The problem with this, a lot of modules. And as you've been hearing from the neuroimaging world, everything seems to be distributed. There are a few modules we do see, but most everything that's going on is massively distributed. When I first started out in reward aversion imaging, Steve Hyman said, we've got to figure out how to see the ventral tegmentum, the dopamine output system, and the nucleus accumbens in humans. No one had seen it. We'd seen it in rodents, but not in humans. That's what we thought was the core of the reward system. After a lot of imaging, at this point, I think the whole brain is involved with reward aversion calibration, literally the whole brain. By the time we get through some of uh, the studies of it, talking about the relative preference theory piece, you'll kind of see why that's needed. Well, the problems with traditional cognitive science and the problems with behaviorism kind of led to a lot of people saying, hey, listen, we've got to start over again. And Peter Lang and Bruce Cuthbert, I, they, I commend them for putting together the research domain criteria project and trying to say, listen, we need to go across scale all the way down to genes and, and different types of behavior. But how they talked about behavior in terms of negative valence systems, positive valence systems, and arousal, those are three ways of talking about emotion. And quite frankly, they should be integrated. Separating them out makes no sense, and you'll see why as we move forward. They also put all the rest of cognition into one domain, which to me makes no sense at all. Each of those domains is as complex as reward aversion. So there's a lot to be talked about here. This is a clear indication that psychiatrists and neuroscientists to some degree have thrown their hands up and said, we've got to start over. It's not a bad thing that we're starting over, but it is a problem about how we think about what is the mind. So I got into this at the time that fMRI was being invented. And I love this slide from the far side where you have a bunch, I, I actually covered over the ice cream truck that is in the window and why the scientists are running out the door. Ice cream truck is there, everyone wants to get out of, out of, the, of the lab and have, a, have some good, something good to eat. I put up the science paper because that is the response you see with these scientists is how we responded to the gadolinium infusion technique that Jack Bellavo published in Science in November of 1991, literally almost 30 years ago. When that happened, they also had a non-contrast technique. And I show over on the right notes actually from Ken Kwong's notebook. How do I know this? Because I worked with him. He's the guy who taught me how to run an MRI and worked with him very, very closely. He, he should get a Nobel Prize for what he, he did. He was also very core to the gadolinium <laughs> contrast technique that Jack uh, published. As this was going on, I was brought in as a postdoc to Bruce Rosen, his first postdoc, to, um, to kind of build out an analysis pipeline. We thought we could see the, mo the, brain, the mind in the brain, and by seeing the mind, understand the mind. So this kind of was, we had this delusional idea right off the bat from this. And what happened is we started doing things like looking at an obsession in real time with an obsessive compulsive disordered patient. This was work put together with Lee Bear. He unfortunately died five years ago, but a wonderful, sweet clinical psychologist, one of the kindest people I've ever known in my life. He was the one who came up with the, 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 the um, provocation paradigm that we used to actually take a look at a, an obsession in an OCD patient. As you can see from the, the maps on the left, we were actually putting the statistical map right on top of the bold image. At that time, we couldn't put it on top of the anatomic image. I was in charge of the team building out the analysis pipeline. We still hadn't gotten there when the paper was submitted in 1994, finally accepted 26 months later. I can't begin to tell you how tough the review process was. Nobody believed it would work. 
This was the first psychiatric fMRI. It was talked about already um, back at the Society of Neuroscience in 1992-93. Uh, On the right, we started getting better at things. This was work that was done with Nancy Ekhoff using um, Ekman faces to start looking at deep subcortical structures. When we sent this out to review at Neuron, uh, two of the, the, the reviewers came back to us after the paper was published. And one of them was Joe um, Ledoux. The other one was Keith Thilborn. And they point blank said, this was the first demonstration that fMRI would work at subcortical systems, okay? So anytime you talk about the amygdala, any of these other things, it's based on this. Um, we were just lucky to be at the right place at the right time with really good people out of MIT, really wow. smart psychologists like Nancy Etkoff to work with. At the same time, we started doing work with Steve Hyman. Um, he became director of NIMH in 1995, 96, while this work was finishing up. And it was the first work using infusions to be able to see the reward aversion system in humans and actually relate it back to behavior such as craving, drug craving, or what is the high that you experience coming off of a drug infusion. We had to do an immense number of control experiments. People didn't believe it worked. Uh, folks at McLean Hospital just ended up kind of getting into a, a wonderful competition for five years to see if they could disprove it, they couldn't. So this work stands, it was the basis of reward imaging. Everything you see has, that has happened subsequently goes out to the same targets. It was a, also what became the basis of what we call the, the, the brain model of human addiction, why? The animal model from Olds and Milner looking at kind of key pressing for electrical stimulation to the medial forebrain bundle, ultimately hit the same circuits that we saw with imaging and got to the same positive reinforcement and sense of salience pieces that we were looking at, but a lot got left out. Um, this brain model, I think, is massively incomplete, but we, that's how it was referred to back then. Um, fortunately, other people were looking at this too. You've probably heard about the, um, what is it, the, the meridian response or the, the central mid meridian response that all people talk about with music or certain types of images that gets them to calm down and that feels very rewarding. Well, Anne Blood was looking at this in 1999, okay? And she was looking at the chills people feel when they see, when they hear music they love. And so she was looking at the chill response and looking at brain imaging. She got exactly the same activation we got when we gave cocaine to people. So she published this paper in, in 1999 and 2001 and cited our paper like mad. She was then hired to, North, uh, to Mass General Hospital, ostensibly to compete with me. All right. Well, we ended up in the gladiatorial pit and realized we had to put our backs to each other. Put our backs to each other, we ended up surviving. She's one of my best friends and longest term collaborators ever. Unbelievably amazing scientist. She's a AAA scientist, but this is some of her early work in music. She's now very focused on motor control, does seminal work in that domain. This work, of course, got um, uh, a lot of people think we had to go to higher uh, uh, range magnets. We got funding out of the White House to build the first seven Tesla magnet. I actually pulled that money in and then subsequently built the first um, uh, phenotype genotype project to ostensibly go to genes. We thought genes controlled everything. So we were going to do an imaging genetic study over a large number of, 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 of people with uh, substance use disorder, depression, and normal controls. One of the big things that came out of it was relative preference theory. We also did a lot of studies, whether it was monetary reward, <coughs> beauty pictures, cocaine, morphine, pain, getting that common circuitry reward and aversion, not just the nucleus accumbens, but literally over the rest of the brain in various interesting ways. One thing that also came about was the monetary reward produced a very similar uh, response to the expectancy of cocaine. Happened to be with Danny Kahneman. We published it in 2001, 2002. He happened to get his Nobel Prize. It was a lucky coincidence. I feel very fortunate that I've spent my last postdoc over four years working with him. And just, I, I feel kind of what we found with relative preference theory has to be dedicated to his intense mentorship and, and kind guidance. Since then, we've done a lot of other stuff, kind of being able to merge, um, uh, uh, develop something we call imaging omics. This is just published in the past two years, um, where you can go from microRNA to metabolomics, to imaging, to, to computational behavior, um, using mediation frameworks and moderation frameworks. Um, we've also developed something you call multi-omics, where you can bring in computational behavior to, to guide the integration of, of transcriptomics in the form of, of microRNA, metabolomics um, together to see where there are abnormalities um, in the metabolome and actually for, for hopefully find critical abnormalities, in this case, the multi-omic approach to head impacts. 
that has led to a, a very clear indication that it's a mitochondrial dysfunction when you get repetitive hit impacts to, um, uh, to somebody. This is work that was just published by uh, Nicole Vike uh, this past year. And from this, we can talk about integrating things across scale. So you can go from hormones and microRNA to you know, uh, perfusion, DTI, and up to um, motor control and other types of, of, of uh, a very quantitative behavior. But there's some problems with this. And I've got very dissatisfied with imaging. I still do it, but I'm very dissatisfied. Initially, the dissatisfaction came about from reading a very short, almost paragraph long short story by um, um, uh, Borges. And I, I, I don't know if that's the correct enunciation for him, but um, he wrote something called On the Exactitude of Science about ultimately how maps are very difficult. In a sense, they, they, a lot of maps are useless unless you understand the priors by which they're made i.e. you have to have a sense of what is the behavior in a quantitative fashion if you're going to interpret, interpret the circuitry. More uh, recent problems like uh, have kind of emphasized this too. Sidney Brenner and the C. elegans work, they, they mapped with intricate detail the 302 neurons involved with C. elegans behavior. They still don't know how it works at all. So all these people saying you've got to map out the brain, then we'll understand behavior. I'm sorry, that's wrong. Point blank wrong and we've got a clear case in point. More recently, kind of from the computational end of it, Jonas and Cording had a great paper um, entitled, Could a Neuroscientist Understand a Microprocessor? Wonderful tongue-in-cheek commentary, all right? They took an existing microchip without knowing what game it encoded and applied 16 different neuroscience mapping techniques to the chip, learned a huge amount of stuff that people who do chip design didn't even realize. It's an, it's an incredible paper, but they couldn't identify the game that the chip encodes. The game was Donkey Kong. So this gets at this issue. Can you imagine mapping out the entire brain and still not being able to figure out what it does? This was proof and concept. Now, more recently, other issues have come up. Winter put out a um, ArchiveX paper. The paper's under review right now, just criticizing neuroimaging in general and how we have to move away from simple associative analyses to more multivariable analyses and, and better feature engineering. That is critical. And feature engineering around behavior. So we're gonna to move to this discussion of feature engineering and what might be considered lawful in the context of behavior. So in a sense, we're moving from the 800 megabyte world of imaging and molecular biology to going to the 800 kilobyte world. Problem that we have with a lot of reward aversion processing, and I play much of cognitive science, is a lot of it is not agent-centered. It's not integrated. There are many frameworks for reward aversion processing, but they're not integrated. There are very few sets of functions that deal with you know, trade-offs. So they can talk about how much we calibrate a reward, but they don't talk about the, the trade-off between approach and avoidance. And almost nothing has been tested to engineering standards of, of, of um, lawfulness. And what do I mean by this? Well, there's a 1965 set of lectures by Richard Feynman about what is lawful in physics. And they can be directly applied to what we're doing with regard to the neuroscience and psychiatric illness. Things have to be strong, have to have strong mathematical or algorithmic description. This is called discreteness. They have to be recurrent. The, these discrete processes have to be recurrent across many experiments and experimental contexts. They have to not be, they can't be trivial. So you can't take any type of noise and reproduce the patterns you see. Furthermore, when you inject noise into the standard data, you can't blow it up quickly. Most, most cognitive science, you inject a little bit of noise, it blows up fast. Something that is really robust slowly degrades with noise. Lastly, Feynman thought things need to be scalable, go from one level of organization to another. In our case, we looked at things in the context of individual behavior and group behavior. How do you do this? Well, you first start with a whole mass of empirical data. You look for what variables might be operative in it and produces discrete mathematical fits. You try to see if it's recurrent across many experiments, robust to noise, scales. It has to allow you to integrate many other prior models and frame new knowledge. This is fundamental. We don't use this iterative model to the most point when talking about psychiatric illness. A lot of times we say, oh, we've got a mathematical model because we don't use it to explain existing data. That's not good enough. You've got to be able to predict new things. 
Right now in psychology and psychiatry, there are 12 putative laws or what we might call primitives, behavioral primitives. That's a term from physics. Of these primitives, four are core constructs in psychophysics, like signal detection theory. Three are central constructs in modern neuroscience, such as incentive reward and reinforcement reward. One of those reinforcement reward is a core construct in machine learning. Two were the basis of Nobel prizes. The one having to do with um, uh, uh, variance mean uh, decision-making from Markowitz, another one port, uh, prospect theory from Kahneman. Of all 12 of these, only one has been tested to full criteria for lawfulness and that's relative preference theory. That's what I'm gonna to talk to you now and how, uh, uh, how it was discovered, what it means, how we use that for the machine learning. It started out as a key press, looking, looking at faces. People could key press to keep up the face longer, get rid of it more quickly, or do nothing about it. You see these raster plots. You can interpret it very simply, kind of like how much, how many key presses did somebody get, use to get rid of an angry face versus keep up and view longer an angry face. But we actually found there are other structures in there are starting to use variables from information theory and a broad range. We saw basically that there was a, uh, initially a trade-off plot between the pattern of your approach and avoidance to key pressing. It was also a value function between your pattern of key pressing and the mean of your key pressing. And lastly, there was a variance mean plot between the standard deviation and the mean of your key pressing. The fits for individuals had incredibly tight R squares. When we first found these in the mid 2000s, uh, our funders did not believe it. The military sent up folks from Argonne the National Laboratory to actually test this. And their comment was, this looks like particle physics, not human behavior but the R squares for the fits of human, individual humans are routinely above 0.8. Just sit with that. An R square for each human above 0.8. You also saw group data. So you could see patterns in groups. So it could, you could look at the scaling between a value function for how much you calibrated what you liked against the pattern of prior judgments, the trade-off between the pattern of prior judgments to avoid versus approach, and then a limit function. Most times when you look at the standard deviation against the mean intensity of something, the function just keeps going up. It's like adding heat to a bubbling thing of water. It, it keep, the, the variance gets more and more, the more heat you add into it, right? Well, a limit function happens with variance mean functions in biology, where the, more you, uh, the, the higher the intensity, it curves back down. This was first seen with Mark Witz in economics, then seen by Modi and de Kunik with gabinergic cells. GreenGuard published something about this with genetic regulation in 2009. We saw this with human behavior, key pressing. Now, we've seen this initially with a key press, and this is a reinforcement reward piece where each key press has a consequence. So this is a behavior consequence um, reinforcement reward framework. But more recently, we've been able to see it with just simple picture ratings. Kind of, you see a picture, you make a rating, it's more an incentive framework. Slight differences to the graphs, but both can be done. The nice thing about the picture rating is it can be done on any cell phone. Now these are recurrent, they're mathematically discrete. They're also recurrent. You could see them with um, a, a model and non-model uh, pictures. Great story about this. Nancy Etkoff had started this project and she kind of said, Hans, let's take a look at how, we've, how we mark up. Are we more like the, the normal controls or are we like the people who make a living like models? Okay, so we actually ran a study like this, put our own pictures in there to see what we did. She did really well, okay? She, got, she was up in the model range. I have to admit, I talk about this public because I was mortified. I ended up at the very lowest end of the average uh, uh, pictures, the non-model pictures. And that's why you don't put your own stimuli into the experiments you do. It's a very great case in point. Anyway, using aesthetic stimuli, we could see the same curves. Using the international affect picture set from Peter Lang and Bruce Cuthbert, we could also see the same curves. Using Food pictures from colored, discolored, prepared, unprepared, prepared, saw the same curves. Lastly, using the Ekman picture set for emotional ca categories of pictures. Then music stimuli, most recently by Sherry Livingood, um, showing that musical snippets got people key pressing in the same way. These are non-trivial and robust without belaboring things. You, no type of noise that we use could ever uh, reproduce things. The X's are the noise uh, the data. The, the circles are the real data. We never could reproduce the, noise, the, the real data using noise. Um, when we use noise to inject into the data, all we saw is that the curves slowly exploded. Um, on, the, on the left is changing the intensity, on the right is changing the valence of the stimuli. Um, so basically this is robust to noise. Lastly, the scaling issue. 
Um, very different than talking about an association. Scaling means that basically almost 100% of variance you see at the individual level um, uh, relates back to the variance at the, at the group level. Um, in this case, um, very clear scaling between the two different sets of curves. Could you integrate this with known features? Well, yeah. The value function we had was very similar to prospect theory and to reinforcement re reward or matching. The variance mean limit function we saw was exactly like what is seen uh, by Markowitz's portfolio theory. And the aliesthesia piece, we could see things go up and down those curves, just like in the trade-off plot. So Kabanach's aliesthesia theory or hedonic deficit directly got into this. Relative preference doesn't replace these, but it has a direct mathematical connection to every single one of these four well-calibrated, well-validated pieces. We've subsequently done a lot of imaging and we can connect it to the imaging too. What's it do? It produces what we call a function space. There are over 60 functions. I'm just showing an abbreviated piece here. It's why preference is so complicated. It's why it's so hard for anybody to really know what they like. A lot of times people go on with these very um, you know, statements. It's clear if you think deeply, you'll understand what you like. That's hard to say. Because when you think about these other constructs, you start thinking about this issue of prospect theory, you calibrate what a group thinks. You think about the variance of things and the cost benefit ratio. You think about what type of deficit state you might be in. You think about the relative amount of something and how much you could get. You start dealing with all that. It is really hard to understand what you like. So I, I put this up here to kind of say that it's complicated and it fails in a lot of ways. It doesn't fail, but our trying to calibrate reward in the here and now readily can fail. Now there's some serious implications. One of this is a lot of times people say preference is clear. You can order, I like, you know, chocolate cake more than vanilla cake, more than carrot cake or something like that. The problem is, is that preference really involves both negative and positive attributions. So if you dislike something a lot and you like it a lot, um, you suddenly have a non you, you have something that's not asymmetric, okay? It isn't that uh, you know one th the carrot the carrot cake is always the least. It may be that you you hate vanilla far more than um, than uh, carrot cake, but you like vanilla more than carrot cake too. We all can talk about this. I was talking about a father-in-law, mother-in-law, you know, all the, we always have these stories, right? So valent, so preference is asymmetric. It also is not commutative. A lot of times we talk about you multiply two things together and it doesn't matter the order in which you do it. But when you start doing matrix math, it actually is very serious. And then lastly, we think about this issue of something being associative. You can go from you know, A plus B plus C, depending on how you add things together should be the same or when you do multiplication. That's actually not the case with preferences. So what does this get at? At its core, Danny Kahneman and many others who've talked about the irrationality of decision-making and preference were 100% correct. The majority, 99% of our judgments are, are irrational. This is a core aspect coming right out of the mathematics. Why does this also make a difference? Well, a lot of what Kahneman talked about was system one, system two, you know, fast automatic decision-making versus decisions where you have to use kind of a, a set of rules and think things through, it's slower. Well, what happens if you both like and dislike something? You get preference and decision, the behavior is an automatic, you've got to kick it up to a system two, where you start thinking about rule-based frameworks by which to do things and then going back and you try to sculpt your unconscious decisions. For instance, I, I love good, good, you know, really, really, um, high caloric food, whether it's from uh, Southern India, whether it's from the Tucson region of, uh, region of Italy, whether it's from Thailand, I love really good food, okay? But I was told I've got to kind of stop the portions that I, I start, I, I, that I start eat with this. So I actually had to sculpt my preferences to like tiny little portions of this really good food. Or you talk about a, a, a super Tuscan wine and foie gras. I love this stuff, okay? But I've got to kind of sculpt my preferences to eat very little of it, be eating fish, vegetables, lots of, of, of vegetables, stuff like this. So we have to sculpt our preferences all the time, all right? Because the, we get to these issues of preference and decision very quickly. There's also this issue that um, Dale Mortensen, another Nobel laureate that we worked with um, and, and published in 2017, when you start integrating these pieces, you can actually start looking at mechanism. 
the behavior itself is mechanistic. You don't have to go down to the molecular biology to be mechanistic. Just let that sit with you. Behavior alone can be mechanistic. And this isn't me. This actually is Martin Paulus coming out of the Laureate Institute, a major player in the ABCD project, an incredible AAA psychiatrist out there. He looked at these, 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 these modeling efforts and he point blank said, you've now shown the behavior is mechanistic, all right? And it has a lot of implications that a lot of features like loss aversion actually vary and change. We could get into this a bit more. There's one more piece to it, but this type of mechanism where you integrate reward with attention and kind of uh, memory variables like relative preference already does, means that we can start talking about emotion in a mathematically discrete way. These feature, these mathematical equations also have very clear features. We can talk about, you know, kind of the, the first derivative of uh, uh, in the upper left of the, of the approach curve against that of the avoidance curve. And they're, they're, the proportion between them is what's called loss aversion, how you tend to overweight losses versus rewards. Other equations that come off of this talk about how um, something called risk aversion, how we tend to like to have one bird in the hand versus two in the bush. Something that's highly valuable but uncertain is not as something we don't like as much as something that is less valuable but certain, okay? There are a lot of these really cool neuroeconomic features that come directly off of these equations. Why is that important? Well, you can use this for prediction. Um, there's also another implication. You take this type of function space and I've simplified it a lot. There are over 60 equations, but this starts pointing to this issue that we can put together a function space of mental primitives, very much like Gotha did in particle physics. The standard model of particle physics is outside of quantum mechanics, the most successful models in science, period, bar none. You hear a lot of people talking about how we have to change them, yes, but no one's throwing it out, okay? We can do the same thing, I believe, starting with reward aversion, moving to memory and attention, and start to do this for, for human mentation. So it means getting rid of traditional cognitive science and traditional behaviorism, start talking about a third framework, which is a function space for human mentation. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that if you think about app development, where you have mind maps and wireframes versus microprocessors and APIs, we can start talking about human behavior the same way people talk about mind maps and wireframes. This is important. This will make a big difference for how you start thinking about depression, anxiety, and things like this. And we'll get into this in a moment when we think about prediction. It also means we can start talking about this idea of a standard model of mind. Laird and others put out a, a serious paper in 2017 from the AI space saying we need to develop a standard model of mind. Well, I would argue psychiatry needs to have this standard model of mind. It will help you with diagnosis. It'll help you with thinking about how to target treatment. It'll help us a lot with the neuroscience. All right, what does this mean for machine learning? I, I run a bit of a, a, my core focus right now is actually in machine learning right now. Machine learning has to do with feature extraction versus classification. There are many types of features you can use, whether it's semantic uh, reports, image morphology, first order stats, second order stats, and lawful functions like with relative preference theory. What are the types of classifiers we use? Topological data analysis, n-dimensional clustering, support vector machines, decision trees, things like random forests, and then neural nets or what might be multi-layer perceptrons, things of this sort. But these are the two core aspects of machine learning. They're equally important. A lot of time we focus on the classification. Remember the term garbage in, garbage out. If the feature is not good, what you put as an output is not gonna be great either. So what do we do in the context of relative preference? Well, we get raw data, segment the approach and avoidance, put them into a set of core variables, put graph relationships and extract those features down below, A, B, C, okay? We pull those features out. We use these preference variables, some demographics and clinical data and a training set. And then we you use that training set uh, to test and look at the average performance over many iterations of it. Um, I like using the Gaussian mixture models that, that are a great way to frame this, but Gaussian processes support vector machines, random forests are great. I actually think random forests are-, are go stop. Sorry? Sorry? Um, so anyway, um, Gaussian mixture uh, models are what we do a lot of very quickly. 
we've used this to take a look at the history of depression in the context of the history of depression. Um, uh, we are looking at how many iterate, how many episodes of depression somebody had had. When we tried to look initially at kind of, you know, out to seven episodes, how many had you had? We were very poor using a, a Gaussian mixture model. Um, when we then went down to a three class problem, we got to 72.5% accuracy predicting how many, you know, whether you had had one versus two to five versus six to seven, seven episodes. Um, when we actually took a look at extremes, from the, the one not having it to six, seven, having had a lot. Um, the support vector machines got very close, very similar. But there's something to this. When you start digging into what variables were most important for this, it was very interesting. So you actually use what's called the variance inflation uh, factor framework. Trump is so spacious. <laughs> I'm sorry, there seems to be some breakthrough, the discussion. Um, but you, you combine this with some uh, correlation analyses um, to take a look at what variables are related, the variables that then have uh, the lowest VIF scores are what the ones you keep. And you do this with the relative preference features. It turns out two features are fundamental to, to getting to an accuracy of, of you know, 71% or so. One of them is a positive turning point. The other is uh, the, the variance in your, in your pr uh, preferences or your portfolio preference. Why is this relevant to thinking about the, the number of depression episodes you've had? With increasing numbers of a number of episodes of depression, you seem to have a higher tipping point, meaning you have to have more things be more rewarding to make approach behavior. So to make an approach decision, things have to be more rewarding the more episodes of depression you've had. The other piece is the more episodes of depression you've had, the more there's a constriction in your portfolio pref preference. What feels good to you gets very confined. And we've all seen this in the context of depression. These are two very fundamental variables for trying to understand what our clients slash patients are going through. When you think about this for predicting self-reported depression, we went through, a, um, in this case, a data set with 3,497 subjects um, with over almost 1,500 variables. We did a grid search to kind of look at the different types of models that were best, ultimately a random force classifier and only 38 features were needed to get to an accuracy of about 81% with a sensitivity of 72%. Um, and in this case, the, um, um, the, the variables were very simple. There's a set of variables out of relative preference and then a set of variables out of how do you spend your leisure time and then your, your age. What this means is you could do basically a four minute task and get to 80% accuracy for predicting if somebody has self-reported depression. Um, suicidality. Um, we looked at this in the context of combining a bunch of, 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 of variables from relative preference theories with uh, one variable about loneliness, with uh, including the PHQ-8. So, you know, the NOC had a recent paper from Harvard about predicting um, suicidality, he included the PHQ-9. As you know, the PHQ-9 includes a variable about what, ask a question whether you're suicidal. So they were using a question about whether you're suicidal to predict if you're suicidal, kind of a circular no-no. So we took out that variable added in the rest of the PHQ-8, uh, uh, along with your age, got to 80. Once you add, add in prior history of attempts, you get up to about a 92% accuracy for predicting whether somebody is planning to kill themselves. Now imagine being able to use that as a pre-screener for coming into the emergency room or coming into your clinic. Um, more recently, we've also been testing interesting architectures to include broader uh, uh, constructs out of cognitive science. So taking the international affective picture set, taking how people rate them and include many other people. This is using a kind of a graph neural net type of framework. Um, when you collapse the graph neural net, what this basically means is you're looking at how an individual rates a picture. That's the kind of the blue line. The picture relates to, to a bunch of, of, of categories. That's the green line. And then you can take a look at the RPT variables that from, and the RPT graphs, how they relate to categories of animals. That's the, the yellow line. So you can take a look at it across a many different set of categories. You can also take a look at the pictures and put them through kind of a, 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 a ResNet multi-layer perceptron neural net framework for actually identifying the picture, include those features with the picture. When we do that, we can actually separate out the pictures pretty well. Um, this is just an example uh, in two dimensions for separating out the nine different categories of pictures people use or uh, used in this. When you um, look at this, you can, um, you can encode basically uh, um, kind of the relative preferences, 
how people in a large group uh, have rated these pictures and also the, the ResNet uh, information about the picture itself. When you do that and try to predict something um, kind of um, um, a, way, a standard way to calibrate like gender, can you calibrate self-reported gender? Um, in this case, we got to an 85% accuracy. That's actually better than what neuroimaging does. So when you use it, segmentation-based brain imaging gets to about 80% accuracy. Um, why does it work? It's because we're embedding kind of the physical characteristics of the goal object with the rate of response. What I'm showing you here is the matching law from reinforcement theory. It's the basis of temporal discounting and a whole bunch of things. But when you embed both sides of this framework into something like a, a graph neural net, you get incredible accuracy. All right, um, just thinking quickly about mechanism in this context. Um, moderation analysis looks at how the interaction between a moderating variable and an independent variable predicts a third one. Mediation looks at how a variable sits in the causal pathway between an independent variable and a dependent variable. In a sense, is in the causal pathway between the two and carries it. One way to think about it is that instead of X going to Y, X goes to the mediator, the mediator goes to Y. All right. Also, when you integrate permutation uh, statistics, then you're really using a true distribution um, and allows you to start looking at small to moderate sample sizes, um, like is common with most brain imaging studies. When you integrate permutation with mediation moderation, some very interesting things happen. This is just one uh, piece that's being written by, by Sumra Bari, um, who also developed this framework for imaging omics. Uh, where you can actually get blood levels of THC metabolites, in this case, 11-hydroxy-THC, um, with a posterior parietal cortex thickness and related to how there's a decreasing range in the portfolio preference of marijuana users. So the more THC you have on board over a long period of time, and keep in mind, this is something that has a long half-life, so you can just do one blood level at, uh, to get an assessment of this. It's related to thinning of the posterior parietal cortex and reduced range of your preference decisions. This is actually quite serious. A lot of people argue about whether THC is a problem. This is actually done uh, in people under age 26. I have no problem with people using THC after age 26, but I think it's incredibly a bad thing for people underneath it. We have a bunch of papers, both in working memory and with relative preference about that. We've also taken a look at permutation-based uh, mediation moderation in the context of depression. And as you see, there are a whole number of variables that end up being the independent variable and contextual variables from age, income, medical history, social disconnection are fundamental for um, how we actually interpret, how, how judgment variables um, uh, relate to depression. Um, in terms of moderation, even COVID variables are very important. Whether people are vaccinated, whether they um, uh, um, um, have had a diagnosis, they're very important contextual variables about how judgment impacts on the, the, um, uh, on the prediction of depression. All right, the synopsis, pulling together function spaces around um, uh, approach and avoidance is important and ultimately around the whole mind is gonna be important for brain imaging in terms of how, you know, understanding what we're seeing at the distributed circuit level for, a, for modeling in a mechanistic way behavior and for what we might call interpretable and hybrid AI. Uh, what I mean by that is being able to understand from the training data to the, the prediction what is going on? This is a, actually a, the, the interpretable AI piece comes out of DARPA, but right now it's very difficult to understand from standard machine learning um, why a prediction is made, why a, a prediction, another outcome didn't happen, why some things succeed, why some things fail, and about trust, whether somebody can understand the trust, the decision that's coming out of that system, or understand why it errs. To do that, we really have to be starting to integrate computational cognitive science and connect it back to brain imaging. A lot of times people with neuroeconomics will say, well, the brain imaging validates the behavior. No, that's not enough. That's just explanation. That's not prediction. Prediction is necessary if we're really going to validate our, 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 our behavioral variables. If you can't predict something out of a behavioral variable, I'm not certain what its purpose is. It's a very strong statement, but I stand by that. Um, feature extraction steps to incorporate cognitive science into machine learning is very important. Um, it changes what is, happens with machine learning, okay? So I look at machine learning performance as being, you know, improved massively when cognitive science starts to get integrated. There's a whole project, actually a $240 million project between IBM, 
and MIT ongoing for 10 years on this one topic. And what we're seeing when we do this for predicting depression, anxiety, suicidality, subjective cognitive decline, the prediction goes way up. And what's very important about this, lastly, is that you're only using one task in a small set of demographic variables. That's it. Very, very simple. So we have a project like this to build this out for the Navy, but quite frankly, we're gonna be launching a very simple framework of this um, probably in July, August. Um, we just had a site visit and they're ramping up the, the effort um, where you can do very simple picture rating, negative three to positive three, about a bunch of pictures. Do put, pull the graph, the graphs and relative preference and the features, put together a profile for a person and start using that for making predictions. Uh, for the military in particular, if you're predicting suicidality, they also need to have high specificity. They need to make sure you can identify who doesn't have suicidality because inaccurately saying somebody has suicidality is a career breaker. It isn't just about saving lives. It's also making sure that somebody doesn't lose their career because of this. So there's a lot that has to go into this. We're a long way from having a perfect system. I expect your generation will be working a lot with this going forward. I expect in five, 10 years, this is gonna be a tool that you will routinely have. I'd like to thank you um, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Breider. We did have one question that came in through the chat um, okay. from Cecilia Reed. If uh, you want to elaborate or clarify a little bit what you mean by that, Cecilia. Sure, uh, hi, Dr. Breider. Um, I was just wondering if most of these studies focused on um, adults that already had fully formed brains, I guess, um, or if there was ever any studies done with pediatric populations in the developing brain and how that affects behavior and how that showed up in other studies? Great question, uh, Cecilia. This is actually a fundamental issue. I mean, you know, we talk about this all the time in the context of the amygdala. Amygdala doesn't get um, uh, myelinated until about age four. And it's very interesting. There's kind of this well-known phenomena that memories before age four become very sparse the older you get, okay? And it's, it's, that's just one core example. Um, but you know the, the, the brain comes out lysencephalic at birth and then starts gyrating, okay? There's a lot of development that goes on before age four that goes on from four to when hormones start kicking in and then hormones starting to slowly stop around age in the late 20s. Um, keep in mind, brain development goes on a long time. Us guys continue to myelinate to age 40 women finish about age 35, okay? So there's this well-known phenomena that women mature more quickly than men. Anybody who does studies with kids will tell you that young women, you know, five-year-old girls, much more verbal than five-year-old boys. Um, and it's, it's amazing the differences by gender, by age, by how much educational resources are, are uh, given to a kid. There's so many issues here that we need to take into account. Um, it's, it's what I'm trying to do is start with the adult and then go backwards because we need to understand how this develops. I don't even think the ABCD project's enough, but the problem is, is you can't, if you take the ABCD project to try to develop a model of the human mind, you're too late. You need to have the prior, then bring it to the imaging and the molecular biology. So I'm an advocate, basically, we need to have in a sense a Manhattan project about building out a mathematical structure of the human mind then going backwards. How does this develop? I think, Cecilia, what we're going to find is there's structures of mental function that are not there in the adult, that are there in the kid, that are really interesting. I mean, the way they will tap into creativity is mind-boggling, okay? It's like we have to go into free association and sit on our an analyst couch to have that degree of creativity. You know, kids kind of go into free association. It's like, boom. That you talk to them and suddenly they're free associating and running around the room and the, the models that they bring in and they, it's like this oceanic sense that they get. Remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Do we have a model of that? Not yet. We actually have a, we think we have a framework, um, but it's very, it's kind of loosey goosey. And what's weird is why does it disappear? Why does it stop being there in the 18 to 22 year old? Why by age 30 is it so hard to free associate? Why do people need to have a glass of alcohol to suddenly free associate? You know what I mean? Now this was talked about in, in meditation. 
with a lot of meditation experience, you rapidly could free associate. It's very interesting what happens, kind of this stripping away of all the clutter to be able to free associate. Kids do it so quick. And it's not like they don't have the same amount of stuff bombarding them from the environment and stuff they don't understand either. And they're trying to interpret. I think the whole issue of development is fascinating. And quite frankly, I think we're gonna find development is much more complex than any of us ever expected. So Cecilia, great question. I, I think this is, this is an, a, a, a really important domain. I had um, kind of a follow-up to that. Um, you mentioned at one point that preference is asymmetric, right? Um, and can you learn preference? Is that the same thing as sculpting, like you mentioned, or are those two, were you referring them as two separate? Sculpting um, is important. Processes? So okay. Cecilia, you can change preferences. What basically we calibrate what we, how we like things against the experience of prior, of a prior experience. So, yeah, but can you learn preference is what I'm wondering. And does oh, yeah. that come so, into so the past, development? Past experience is part of that. And you can actually um, do stimulus response type of training to change a person's preference. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you think about this in the context of kids who have in, uh, education rich environments versus kids who have education poor environments. Yeah, you change their preference profile massively by that differentiation. And it gets to the whole point why we need to be putting so much into early adolescent, early childhood, you know, uh, education, understand it better, and adolescent education. There's so much we could do for, for kids and youth in this country, and we're not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Breider. We really appreciate your insight, and this has been an incredible uh, lecture for us, and we're, we're really excited to, to learn more about it and as we go through our careers and see this unfold. Um, we do have to, to get moving, unfortunately, to the next portion of the, of the conference, but is, would you be willing to share contact information with the attendees today, or would you, or maybe you could share, you could email it to me and then I could disseminate to the, to others? Now here's my email. Um, although I, um, there is a high, I am being poached potentially by another university. So I'm going to put, um, um, that's one, this, the, the email at uh, Harvard will stay consistent. So those two emails, I'm right now responding heavily to the Northwestern. I will always have a presence at Northwestern, but there's another AI, big AI effort that's developing um, and they're trying to poach me very seriously. So I, I may in four months be at another place that I'll still be working with the same group at Northwestern and my grants will stay at Northwestern. All right. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you again in Sykeson. This has been a great experience and we'll hopefully see you more around. Thank you so much. You're welcome and good luck. I hope all of you go into psychiatry and bring your diverse experiences and perspectives to it. We need it. So I hope you go there. Thank you. Thank you.